Welcome to Chiropractic Science, where you get to hear interviews with leading chiropractic researchers from around the world. Hear about chiropractic research from the authors in plain English, not through the media, nor a middleman. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I'm the host of Chiropractic Science. I'm a senior clinical faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University, and I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Today, I have the special privilege of being interviewed by my mentor, Dr. Greg Kramer. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed to Chiropractic Science, and I am especially appreciative to all of you who have contributed five-star reviews on iTunes. iTunes reviews really help others find out about chiropractic science. So if you like the show, please take a second and write a review. It will support chiropractors everywhere. I'd like to share a review on iTunes from Dr. Hella Leap, who says, I have started listening to Dr. Dean's podcast on my way to work every morning. I find myself listening sometimes to the same podcast a few times since there is so much great information. It truly inspires me to learn more about my profession, even after 27 years in practice. Well, thanks, Doc, for sharing your knowledge, uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate your review. I look forward to sharing your flattering iTunes review in a future podcast. Please consider making a contribution to Chiropractic Science to keep these podcasts going. You can do so on our website, either by making a donation or purchasing the evidence-based patient education slides presentation. In fact, I just created a new version of the slides presentation, and it's currently on sale. We are also on social media, including Facebook and Instagram, so please connect with us there. All right, on to the podcast, and we'll have Dr. Greg Kramer uh, start in with the podcast. Well, greetings, and uh, my name is Greg Kramer. I'm professor and dean of research at National University of Health Sciences, and Dean and I have collaborated uh, for many years now, and he's one of my favorite people, so this is a, a real privilege. You got a, a very brief introduction to Dr. Smith, but just to fill in some gaps, uh, Dr. Smith is a senior clinical faculty member in the, in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University. He also maintains a private practice of chiropractic in Eaton, Ohio, at Essence of Wellness Chiropractic Center. He's founder and host of Chiropractic Science, this podcast. Chiropractic Science is dedicated to publicizing chiropractic research through podcast interviews with leading chiropractic scientists. In his private practice, Dr. Smith incorporates lifestyle intervention, that is exercise, nutrition, other non-drug methods, with chiropractic adjustments and other manual methods to encourage wellness. He's been in practice now for over 20 years. Uh, Dr. Smith's education includes a bachelor's degree in human biology, a master's degree in exercise science, a doctor of chiropractic degree and a PhD in brain and cognitive science with a focus on motor behave, behavior and postural control. His research interests lie broadly in the area of human movement and coordination. He's mostly interested in how chiropractic, exercise, and rehabilitation affect human performance. The scientific articles have been published in such journals as Human Movement Science, the Journal of Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, Chiropractic Research Journal, and Chiropractic and Osteopathy, the Open Neurology Journal, and others. Dr. Smith has played several competitive sports, such as soccer, hockey, and golf. He had a varsity golf scholarship at Miami University, where he now teaches and does research as well. He has provided chiropractic care to professional athletes, including Women's Tennis Association Tour Pros, at the Canadian Open. He also works with Varsity University and high school athletes. Dr. Smith is also an internationally certified chiropractic sports practitioner. So with, all, with uh, that in mind, I feel completely inadequate to conduct this interview. Right, so we're going to continue on here, and well, I have... Uh, I must say it, uh, feels, it feels weird to be introduced on my own podcast. <laughs> I bet it does. But having participated in these, I would like to say how how important I think uh, this uh, this effort of yours is, Dr. Smith. It's a very uh, important. Uh, these podcasts are important. I know several 
Journal clubs are now using them to help the students in the journal clubs get an idea of um, who is doing research related to chiropractic and what that's about. And, uh, and I know the, the podcasts have been extremely successful for a very good reason. I'd like to just begin by asking you a couple questions uh, to get a little uh, sense about who you are, even though you've been doing these podcasts for a long time. Your listeners uh, probably are interested in knowing a little bit more about you. So, Dean, can you tell us how you became interested in becoming a chiropractor? Yes, I sure can, Greg. Um, well, I first started seeing a chiropractor when I was about eight years old. Um, I had an injury to my knee, of all things, um, not my back or neck or anything, uh, but my knee. And I was playing soccer at the time and uh, also curling, if you're familiar with that uh, sport, popular in Canada. And so anyways, my knee was uh, giving me some problems. And I went to our general practitioner, family practitioner, and um, he suggested to just lay off of it for somewhere around four to six weeks and that I should be feeling better at that time. So he prescribed me some pain medicine and that was about it. Uh, and I recall the visit was pretty short and I don't recall even having my knee touched or examined, which was a little bit strange, but, um, so anyway, so that's what I remember from the experience. And then, uh, we were coming home and I think it was actually from that visit, uh, I got out of the car, I was limping around and our neighbor said, Hey, why don't you go see my chiropractor? And, uh, my mom who was, uh, uh, a nurse and also a teacher, she looked at me and I looked at her and <laughs> I, said, I think I said, what's a chiropractor? And um, so anyways, we ended up going to see this chiropractor and the chiropractor explained how uh, the nervous system uh, regulates and controls everything. And, and I thought it was reasonable. And so anyways, he started working on my knee, adjusting my knee, mobilizing it, use some uh, modalities, I think, um, electric stim and maybe ultrasound and also adjusted my back and my neck. And so I started feeling better. I'd say maybe three or four days after, uh, the first set of treatments and, uh, and actually about a week or two after I felt amazing. I felt, uh, my knee was stronger than it ever had been before. And I had periodically, had some back pains that came on when I played hockey after about five or 10 minutes on the ice, kind of being bent over a little bit, I had some pain and I noticed that those pains were gone too. So that's how I got interested in chiropractic. And, uh, my brother is actually a chiropractor as well. And, uh, okay. for, for pretty similar experience. That's interesting. I didn't know your brother was a chiropractor as well. Yeah. Uh, what got you interested in uh, in then pursuing a master's degree and then a PhD, both from Miami of Ohio? Yeah, so well, I went to Miami for uh, the the golf scholarship and took a basic uh, pre medical kind of curriculum. Um, but I guess it was there were a few experiences that led me back to school. Um, I had some cases uh, when I was practicing in Ontario full time that I didn't think I'd ever see in practice. Uh, I had this little boy with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, and he came in with um, this really blotchy skin, uh, these pinpoint hemorrhages. And uh, his next uh, resort after seeing a chiropractor was to uh, get surgery. So basically the parents brought him in. Uh, I think he was about eight or nine at the time. And they said, well, if this doesn't help, he's got to have surgery done. And so the surgery that they were thinking about was splenectomy. So uh, as oftentimes happens in practice, they said, can you help? And I, I said, well, I don't know. Um, I was just being honest. And I said, well, you know, what I knew at the time was to let's try three times a week for three or four weeks. <laughs> so that was my solution at the time. And uh, so that's what we did. I, I suggested that uh, we try it and we see how we did uh, with this clinical uh, uh, trial of care. 
And so after about two weeks, his, his hemorrhages, uh, the, the coloration went from a kind of a darkish red or purple color to a lighter pink color. And um, then another week went by and same thing, a little bit better. And then he had some lab work done and his platelets uh, elevated. So there were some signs... Uh, physically as well as through his blood work that things were getting better so that got me interested in um, you know pursuing how could this possibly be because I didn't know that chiropractic could have this kind of effect um, and so I ration out I rationed to myself that maybe maybe what had happened was uh, the dysfunction in his spine leading to his spleen perhaps could have been the issue. I've since think it's uh, maybe more, you know, complex interactions between the nervous system and and the endocrine system that may have uh, done it. But uh, and I'm not sure it was exactly the chiropractic, but the the parents, you know, swore that uh, nothing else uh, had worked, nothing else was changed in his diet or anything like that. So I, I really started to think maybe it was the adjustments that had some kind of influence. And then the other thing that really interested me were uh, my cases uh, of athletes. So athletes seem to always say, well, I get better performance and I seem to be stronger, etc." And so between those kinds of cases, uh, it was probably eight months, nine months into full-time practice and I decided, well, I should go back uh, because this is where uh, my interests are now pointing me. Fascinating. So um, now you're still in practice, I believe. And, and could you tell us a little about your practice? And then also, um, if this is the case, and I think from our previous conversations that it may be that how your teaching and research affects your practice and vice versa. And how does this relate to evidence-based practice? Yeah, for sure. So I have been in practice the, the entire time that I've uh, been through school. In fact, I've never left practice. I guess that's the best way to say it. Uh, I did reduce my hours a bit uh, as I was going through the master's and PhD program. Um, what, uh, what ended up happening was that after the PhD program, I, I ended up teaching full time and I ended up teaching anatomy primarily. Uh, I'm in the kinesiology department at Miami university and I'm a clinical faculty member there. So I teach anatomy primarily. I teach motor skills courses and I also teach, uh, uh, an introduction to kinesiology course for our undergraduate students. Um, another course that I've recently started is um, a musculoskeletal dysfunction and corrective exercise course. So that uh, I also teach to graduate students. So those are the courses that I teach. Um, and so that with that wide range of perspectives and subject matter, I do, I bring that information into the practice. And then, um, so for instance, if I'm learning about something or teaching about something at school and I see someone with a particular you know, musculoskeletal dysfunction, then I can utilize that information and uh, bring it right into the practice with patients. Vice versa, on the other side of things, I, I also uh, take interesting cases that I might see in practice or problems, I guess you might say challenges that I see. And then I like to bring that into research to try to figure out, you know, how does this stuff work? And uh, so that's how it goes. It's it's very interesting. It's uh, challenging, I guess you would say, to incorporate research, to teach, and to uh, still have a bit of a practice. And I wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for my wife, actually, Greg. Uh, you know, I don't think that I could have a solo practice and do everything. So the administrative work these days, uh, you know, electronic health records and all the administrative things, uh, it's, it's difficult for one person to do all that. So I'm fortunate to have, uh, my wife, who's also a chiropractor, be able to help out in that regard. Oh, that's great. Um, and I met, uh, Jane and she is, uh, she is fantastic uh, and a fabulous chiropractor. And I know you've published a case study with her along the way as well. 
That's right. Yeah. She was actually the chiropractor. And if we have time, maybe we can talk about that case. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, I'm wondering what prompted you to begin uh, this series of podcasts on chiropracticscience.com. Yeah. Well, um, truth be told, I actually wanted to interview you um, those years ago and find out more about your research and uh, find out more about what you were doing, what your interests were, and I guess uh, to get inside your brain and figure out why did you want to do the studies that you've done? Um, what was it that led you to those studies? How do you interpret those studies? Um, and then, you know, a little bit of period of time went by after we did that first interview, I think several months, and I started thinking to myself, well, you know, I think other people probably would be interested in listening to the conversation. And, you know, at the time I just thought, well, I can archive this for myself and this would be cool. You know, I could listen to it. I thought it was a great conversation and I learned a lot. So I started thinking, well, maybe other people will learn too. And then that's basically how it, how it happened. And so then I interviewed Katie Pullman and, uh, and then it just kind of took off. And so anywhere and everywhere I get the opportunity now, I just try to, uh, make connections, uh, find out who's doing what. And, and I guess a lot of it still is, uh, for my own sake, I guess, uh, I'm just curious. I, I have burning questions about people's research. I want to know what they're doing and how they do it, how they think, because to be honest, I, I want to be a better researcher myself. And, and I think hearing from the best people in the profession can only be a good thing. And it, it really has carried over to the way I think, the way I present myself. Uh, I've got a lot of confidence from interviewing the best in our profession. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's just kind of taken its own form, I guess, over the years. Oh, that's, uh, I want to say it's interesting, but, uh, the entire project is interesting. And, uh, and also I was just on your website today and, um, and there must be about 30 uh, podcasts on there, at least, uh, of the, uh, the various researchers that you've interviewed, some very recently. So it's, uh, it's a terrific resource. So um, you've done a great job. And now you've also done a lot of very interesting research of your own uh, over the years. And I think, uh, I think your listeners would be really interested in in hearing about some of the work you've done. So um, this uh, one important uh, recent series of studies that you did was um, with through the Department of Defense on a very large grant from the Department of Defense, and you assessed uh, the effects of manipulation on reaction times of special operation forces, military personnel, in a randomized controlled trial. And uh, this ties in, I know, with your PhD work on, on uh, the effects of um, uh, various factors on motion analysis. And, uh, and so you were the right person to, to do this, this component of a very large, important study. Can you talk about it a little bit with us, Dr. Smith? Absolutely. Well, and I'll just give a little uh, background to the study. As I recall, I, I think you were the one actually who sent me an email saying, hey, Dean, you should get involved in this study. And if I'm not mistaken, you uh, made the connections happen for me. So I really appreciate that. And you're right. It's, uh, this kind of work is right up my alley. In fact, it's what I've done a lot of my research on in the past. So um, I'd be happy to talk about this study. Uh, so the Department of Defense put out a request for proposals to look at the effect of chiropractic care on uh, special operations forces personnel. And it was interesting because they were specifically looking for reaction times and reflexes, I believe, was in the proposal as well. Uh, so we put in this uh, request uh, through Palmer uh, and, uh, we ended up getting it. And so I'll, I'll tell you about what it is we studied and, uh, and what we learned from it. So in terms of, um, where it was conducted, it was conducted at Fort Campbell in, uh, Kentucky, and we had 120 special operations forces personnel in the study. And the, uh, 
people were randomized into uh, one of two groups, 60 in each group. One group uh, received chiropractic adjustments, and the other group was in what's called a wait list control. So they didn't actually receive any active treatment per se, uh, but they were just a control group that we could use to uh, uh, look at the results of uh, the other group and make a comparison. So um, the way that the study uh, was carried out was we had a baseline visit where we uh, performed a series of tests. Of course, we had them consent to participate. Um, and so we made sure they met all the eligibility criteria. And then we performed a bunch of tests with them. And I'll describe quickly these tests. Basically, what the tests all did was to look at um, modifications of response time. And I'll define that for our listeners. Response time is the time it takes from the initiation of a signal. So that could be, for example, if you're looking at a computer monitor, it might be a light flash on the screen. And then we look at the responses of the participants to something like that. So when the light comes on, uh, between the time it takes for the light to come on to the time it takes for the person to start doing something or moving, that's what we would call reaction time. And then uh, the rest of response time is how long it takes for somebody to move. So Response time is really a coupling of movement time plus reaction time. And so that's basically what we looked at in this series of study, uh, experiments uh, within this overall study. So we had uh, one uh, type of test, a simple reaction test uh, that we carried out before and after adjustments and before and after rest, which was in this weightless control group. Um, we, so we had simple reaction times. We also measured uh, more complex or choice reaction time where they had one of four choices to choose from. Uh, these studies were done on a computer. So same thing, uh, we, they see a light and they press a button or they pressed a foot pedal. So we had them do both hand and foot responses. Um, another uh, type of um, thing that we measured was what's called Fitt's law. And uh, Fitt's law is uh, a relationship, a mathematical relationship between the distance that one moves and the difficulty of targets that they move to. And so picture this, if you're looking at a computer monitor and you see, let's say, two circles on the screen, the size of the circles and the distance between the circles will determine how fast you respond or how fast you move. So if the circles are really small and they're very far apart, it's going to take you a lot longer to move between those targets than it would if the circles were big and very close together. So that was another measure that we looked at. We also um, did another interesting measure, which was uh, to use uh, lighted circles on a, on a board, a, a panel, uh, and um, basically what happened was it's the kind of thing that you see maybe people using at a gym or some uh, kind of fitness club where they're uh, trying to go as fast as they can between these circles. So they hit a, a lighted panel uh, um, on this board and then another light pops up uh, and shines and then they try to hit that panel and so on and so forth. So basically uh, people in this study tried to hit 100 of these, or they did hit 100 of these, as fast as they possibly could. So those were the tests that we did in this particular study. Uh, we measured those times, both reaction times and response times, uh, for everyone, for both groups. And there were a series of visits. So uh, there were uh, three times that people got adjusted over a two-week time period, and then the waitlist control group came in a couple of times as well so that we can measure their responses. So the long and short of it in terms of the results were that we didn't find uh, any differences in reaction time, uh, either simple reaction time or choice reaction time. Uh, and that was our primary measure. We really wanted to see if if chiropractic care could somehow affect reaction time or response times over a two week period of time. In other words, we were interested to see if there was something other than just an acute effect. Well, we didn't see anything other than a, an acute effect, but what we did notice in terms of the acute effect was this uh, panel of lights where people were uh, hitting these 
each light and then it would go off and then the next one would come on. Uh, both times we assessed that uh, before um, the adjustment, right after the adjustment, on two separate occasions, uh, both of those came out significant. In other words, they did that task significantly faster than the wait list control group. So that was that study. Um, it was interesting because the, uh, you know, we were thinking about it afterwards, you know, is it even reasonable to think that these highly trained people are going to change the reaction times? Um, possibly not. I mean, they're so well trained. I mean, so there's, there's some, certainly some limitations to the study, but I still think it's a, a quite interesting, and especially the, when it comes to those longer response times, it took about 60 seconds or so, 40 to 60 seconds, somewhere in that range, uh, to complete that longer uh, panel of lights to hit those lights. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting that that's where the significance came out. It's really interesting. So it makes me think that... Uh these special operations forces should have a chiropractor on their team to adjust them before they go out to uh, go after Osama bin Laden or something. <laughs> well, you know, as some of my patients say, why don't you just come home with me and <laughs> get me adjusted regularly? So it would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I see what you mean that you may have kind of a ceiling effect with these super elite combat soldiers um, that uh, they may be about as, uh, have as short a reaction time as any humans on earth. They're basically super elite athletes. Um, so I was wondering, uh, have you thought about repeating the study on a uh, kind of a typical uh, chiropractic population or typical uh, patient population of any kind, just to um, just to see if if, uh, if kind of the the rest of of us uh, would respond differently. Yeah, that's a great question, Greg. And uh, in fact, a part of that, uh, the Fitz Law part, we did do a study. Uh, we published it in two thousand and six in JMPT. Uh, where we did show, at least with a small sample size, that the typical chiropractic patient does make uh, an improvement in the uh, in the response time, and in fact, just basically the movement time. So they got faster uh, with chiropractic care. Um, so that was in 2006. That was actually one of the um, impetuses for the uh, for the DOD study. Um, in terms of the other things, now that I've seen how this more complex task that takes a long time to complete came out in the DOD study, that's certainly something that I'm interested in investigating. Um, in fact, anything related to human behavior and chiropractic, the, how chiropractic might affect human behavior, I'm interested in. It just so happens that I think a lot of the time we we measure movements and we measure time to complete tasks and those sorts of things as measures of behavior. So that's why I'm interested in it, but you're absolutely right. I, I want to carry on this line of work. Yeah. Interesting. And I was wondering, maybe uh, I think your subjects in the DOD study got uh, either three or four adjustments. Uh, you can uh, help me remember. And then um, over two weeks, um, I'm wondering if perhaps that number uh, would your results would change if the number of treatments was increased. Um, you know, Mitch Haas has done that very interesting work on dosage and has found that uh, that 12 adjustments is optimal for low back pain. And I know this is a different parameter, but um, I'm just wondering if in uh, in this elite population or in just a general population, if maybe, maybe a dosage study would be interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Dosage is certainly one of the things that we thought of might be a limiting factor. Um, in addition to that, the other thing that we thought about was perhaps the tasks weren't as difficult as they needed to, to be to show an effect. Uh, as you said, uh, we may have hit a ceiling effect here. In other words, 
they just couldn't get any better because they're already that good. And so it, it's possible that if we made the tasks a little bit harder, then we might be able to show an effect. So I think a coupling between increasing the visits and also increasing the um, uh, increasing the um, challenge. Yeah, the challenge. I, I think those two would be uh, a great combination to add. Neat, neat. We've done another study on uh, exercise and this and movement time, aerobic exercise and. Um, uh, that's a fascinating study, uh, and that also uses Fitts Law. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure can. Yeah, so I was talking with one of my colleagues at the university, Randy Clater. Uh, he's an exercise physiologist, and I was showing him some of the data, actually, from that 2006 paper we were just talking about uh, in in my own practice and how people responded with chiropractic care. And what we found was that there was approximately a 9% improvement in movement time after people got adjusted. And so I was showing this to him and, and we had talked, you know, previously many times about uh, the effect of exercise on the brain and how it may uh, create some sort of priming effect. In other words, it primes the body and the brain to be able to get ready for future exercise and future motor behaviors. And so he was interested in repeating essentially the study we did in 2006 with Fitz Law to an exercise population, people that were engaged in exercise. And so that's what we did. We, uh, we got 19 uh, students from the university between the ages of 19 and 28, I believe it was. And what happened um, was we, we did a within subjects design. So the students served as their own control group. We, we brought them in for baseline testing. We looked at their VO2 max, which is a measure of their maximum oxygen uptake. And uh, so we got an assessment essentially of how fit they were. Uh, and that was important because we needed to know how hard to train them to try to get this uh, response. And so they came in on baseline, they did the testing, and then they came back about a week later. And then we divided them into uh, an exercise uh, task, which was running on a treadmill again, or to um, a resting control group. So now I say group, but it's really, it's the same people. They're just going to switch a week later uh, to do the other tasks. So they do exercise one week and then they come back uh, the next week and they do rest or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so um, after we did that, we had them uh, run on a treadmill at 65% of their maximal oxygen uptake, which is considered to be moderate intensity exercise. So they did that for a half an hour. They did two blocks of Fitz Law trials where we manipulated the difficulty of the task. And they then did the intervention, which was exercise or rest. And then we repeated the same blocks of Fitz trials twice again. And then we looked at the responses. And so when we started uh, looking at the data, what we noticed was that the people who had just had a bout of exercise performed significantly faster on this Fitz Law task at every index of difficulty that we measured. Um, that compared to the control group who they also improved doing the task, but not as significantly as the exercise group. And that's to be expected when you perform any mortar task, especially if it's something that's new, you would expect to have some sort of, I guess, practice effect from doing that. But the practice effect, if you will, was significantly more enhanced with the exercise. So that, that's what we uh, found out with that, particularly st that particular study. And in terms of an overall reduction, we found what is amazing to us is almost identical to the chiropractic groups that we, or the chiropractic group that we talked about before, instead of a 9% reduction, we had like an 8.2 or 8.3% reduction 
in the exercise group. So one thing that we've been thinking about uh, after doing that study is let's do a study where we look at chiropractic adjustments plus exercise to see if we can have um, an additive effect to the motor performance. Oh, very neat. That's, that would be really interesting. Yeah, that would, uh, and that's a good example of how, um, how research evolves and how findings from research studies um, help move thinking forward. So that's excellent. Did you look at um, a relationship between how fit these people were based on their VO2 max uh, initially and their responses? Did the people who were the most fit have the biggest difference or the smallest difference? Or did, did you look at that at all? Or Yeah, that's a great question. And that is certainly the interest of Dr. Clater, my colleague, in looking at that, at that further, um, he did take a look at that. We, we apparently didn't have enough separation between the individuals to, to know, like there, there, in other words, there wasn't a big difference in the fitness levels across the population to really get at that kind of question. Uh, but that's certainly something that we want to look at in the future because, uh, it's his contention that the better fit are going to have a better response. I'd also imagine um, that uh, these that your patient population would be pretty fit overall, or you know, prob- possibly a little more fit than the general population. And I'm wondering if if then if you study, you know, um, when I was in practice, we had a lot of unfit patients, <laughs> you know, deconditioned patients, and I. And I'm wondering if they, how they might respond and uh, uh, kind of back to what we talked about earlier with the elite, uh, elite combat troops, if, um, if you might get even a, be- a stronger response in, in kind of a general population, but don't mean to harp on this, but that's just seems interesting. Yeah, I, I really do think uh, we need to investigate some of these parameters, you know, it's, it's just easy to to get university students as your subject population because they're there, but yeah. absolutely uh, we need to we need to do these kinds of investigations with uh, with our patients. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I mean, this is really important work that you're doing and fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, you know, you've also done a series of. Uh, case studies and letters to the editor. And I was wondering if uh, um, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I think you've probably written half a dozen letters to the editor, and I've worked with you on some of these, and I've found the experience to be really rewarding. And, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, I, I see letters to the editor as uh, as a way that essentially any chiropractor uh, could start to get involved in the research process. Uh, for me, reading an article and, you know, going through the methods and painstakingly uh, trying to detail everything that an author has in an article certainly takes a lot of time, as you know, and it takes a lot of concentration And when you come across things that either don't fit in with the literature that's been done before, or there's maybe bias that you are reading that you're interpreting from someone's data, um, you know, those are the kind of things that interest me in in wanting to write a letter to the editor. Um, But I think in general, you know, letters to the editor are great because they can possibly help to correct factual errors. Um, they can, you know, try to get to the idea of, you know, is this opinion or is this interpretation? Um, are the conclusions based upon good evidence, poor evidence, that sort of thing. And, and, um, so that's where I've basically been, uh, through with all of these letters to the editor. And as you know, there are a couple that I was really, uh, how shall I say hot? 
<laughs> after I read the main paper. And um, I just needed a way to vent, I think, uh, to, to cognitively vent. Maybe that's the best way to say it. And to get, to get out some of the frustrations, to try to make some corrections of either factual errors or interpretations that I thought were heavily biased. And so that's where, uh, you know, we've written our letters to the editor together. Um, and, and so I, th I think they're a really critical piece to the puzzle. Uh, they certainly are not going to get cited as often as the main paper, but I think many scientific, uh, authors do read these and, and it does have the, um, possibility of, you know, being noticed by the right people at the right time and the right place. So I think they're definitely worthwhile. Again, I, I say that any chiropractor I think could, um, could get to a point where they could write a letter to the editor. So I think that's also an advantage, uh, for our profession. But as you know, I mean, there are some heavy biases still to this day against chiropractic. And uh, in my opinion, we need to call them out, especially when the facts are otherwise. Yeah, a couple things come to mind as you're talking. And um, one is that um, in going through this process, um, it kind of starts with venting, but then you really dig deep. And by the time you submit the letter, uh, we've kind of calmed down uh, a lot. And it's very um, non-emotional, just focusing on the facts. Which, uh, one point about letters to the editor, if, if someone is interested in doing them, uh, generally it's good to... to Sometimes you read a paper and there are just so many things that that you think are uh, need work, but you really need to focus on one or at most two things and keep it you know keep it brief, uh, two hundred to six hundred words, and um, and just really you know really hone that one argument, uh, and and that's what uh, editors are looking. Are looking for so um, and then also if you if you don't feel knowledgeable in a particular subject matter collaborate um, with someone who is uh, who is uh, up on the literature in that particular area and um, and uh, and I think that's something that these folks can uh, that your audience can can use as well and like you said, when the literature is searched, a lot of times the letters pop up uh, with the original article. And so at least you can uh, lend some balance to, uh, to the literature. So um, I agree with you. I think they are useful. And you are, out, you are just so good at it. And it's, uh, it's been a real treat to work with you on a couple of these, so on a few of these. So thank you for that. And... Um, and that kind of leads into another area of work which uh, uh, you've been involved with, and that's uh, case studies. And um, I think case studies are so important. We've really emphasized those here at National as a way for our clinical faculty and clinicians to get involved in research. The uh, literature review component and introduction to case studies is basically the same as a clinical trial. And and you can learn so much. And when we uh, have our faculty present these, um, the students uh, here love them. And, uh, and I think uh, um, general practitioners love them as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, case studies in general and the ones that you've published in particular? For sure. Well, uh, case studies, what I see them as doing for us as a profession is to take the for lack of a better way to describe it, the real battle conditions that chiropractors see, the real daily practice, and bring those to the scientific literature. I mean, if you look at our literature, there are lots of gaps, as there are in, in any literature, whether that's medicine or PT or any other health profession, there are gaps. And the fact of the matter is that most of the chiropractic profession is in practice. And 
They're the front line. They're the people that are seeing all of these interesting cases. And they have a big role to play in my mind as to leading or maybe not leading, but um, providing some guidance as to where to take our randomized clinical trials, where to spend our dollars. And so they're great for hypothesis um, raising. Uh, they're They're great for just talking about an interesting case, but I think in the long haul, some really well done case studies can inform uh, us researchers as to where we need to, to spend our time and, and, and look at uh, how it is that we can better help and better serve our patients. Uh, So that's what I see the power of uh, a really good case study as being. And that's why I love to talk about case studies because the really interesting things tend to happen in case studies. And then if we can carry those over to randomized trials, well, even better. Um, I'll, I'd be happy to talk about uh, one case study that we published. And, and I would actually call this one uh, an N equals one study because it was a prospective study with lots of different uh, um, uh, measurements that we took. And This uh, was a a young girl, and this case was published in 2009, and the the case was called Running Posture and Step Length Changes Immediately After Chiropractic Treatment in a Patient with Zero Derma Pigmentosum. And so I I talked about one of my reasons for getting into chiropractic research before the the boy with um, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So... I never thought I'd see that in practice. And then same thing with this. We never thought we'd see someone with a condition that was this rare, but we did. And uh, the parents came in and, and they happened to consult uh, my wife. uh, And they asked her the same thing, you know, as uh, the, the parents of the boy with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, you know, can you help? And, Bottom line, don't know. Uh, you know, there's nothing in the literature that we could point to, but uh, sure, we could make some some kind of rationale for it. Um, the The major thing that she was having a problem with, and the reason for the consult was that her locomotion uh, was uh, awkward. I guess would be one way to describe it. Um, people with XP tend to have an awkward kind of gait. Uh, the motor patterns are not quite normal. And the, the major thing uh, in her case was she was actually running into walls. Uh, she just had difficulty controlling the mobility. And um, so that's what the parents brought her in for. And so uh, my wife worked with her for a number of visits. I think it was maybe a dozen visits. Uh, and then we thought to ourselves, geez, uh, you know, this is such an interesting case. We should bring her into the laboratory and do some measurements. So that's in fact what we did. We brought her into the laboratory at Miami University and uh, a colleague, another colleague of mine um, helped out with this um, uh, particular study. Mark Walsh is his name. He's a biomechanist. And basically we wanted to look at her running posture before and after adjustments. So we had her run, uh, we had her all markered up uh, as we do in, in the biomechanics lab. And so we had video cameras on her and we had her run across a force plate as well. And what we noticed was what we noticed in clinical practice, which was that after she got adjusted, her step length seemed to be a little bit longer, which to me uh, was possibly an indication that she was more stable. Uh, She was more willing to take a longer stride. And the other thing was that she was more upright and, and behaviorally, and I think this is the biggest thing and what the parents were interested in, she wasn't colliding with objects. So that was um, uh, that particular study. And uh, so we used, you know, typical statistical tests and whatnot to, to demonstrate that we had made a, a, a difference in terms of her running pattern and her, her posture. That's fascinating. That, uh, I remember seeing your presentation on that case, and it was just absolutely fascinating. Um, so thank you. Uh, what are you currently working on, Dean? Um, do you have uh, some projects that are in the hopper that you're 
Is. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, I have several, uh, papers, uh, the life of, uh, me with being in practice and whatnot. I, I, right now I have two or three papers that I just need to write up and, and get submitted to journals. Um, but we just completed one. I'll quickly tell you about it. And then, uh, as for the results, I'd, I'll have to get to that later. Uh, we haven't presented it anywhere, but we will actually be presenting this data um, that I'll tell you about in a second at ACC Rack in March of 2018, so this year. And uh, so that study um, was done with uh, Katie Pullman, who, whom you know, uh, she's down in uh, Parker. Um, a couple of her students contacted her and, and were interested in finding out or doing a study rather on the effect of uh, adjustments on uh, standing posture, postural sway. And so Katie thought of me and I was really glad she did because that's essentially what I do. And uh, the, the students had this amazing idea, which I had never thought of before. And so this is, I love this kind of uh, integration. I love that the students got involved too. Um, but they had suggested uh, that we do a study where we look at upper extremity adjustments and lower extremity adjustments on postural control. And so, uh, uh, you know, Katie contacted me and then I contacted one of my friends, uh, Josh Hayworth, who is in uh, California now. And he did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins and he's got a lot of interesting background in analyzing postural sway from a nonlinear dynamic perspective. And so I thought, you know, I've always wanted to do a study where we looked at the nonlinear uh, measurements for postural sway and postural control because previous studies have have not really found a whole lot when you look at biomechanical measures of sway like the sway, the length of the sway, or the speed, the velocity, and those sorts of things. Um, but with these measures, these nonlinear measures, what we can look at is essentially the orderliness, I guess you might say, of the sway. How rhythmic is the sway? Is it orderly or disorderly? And uh, so that's what we did. And um, I look forward to presenting the results uh, at ACC RAC. Actually, uh, um, Chris and Cody are the two students, and they're going to be presenting that um, uh, there. So I won't even have to present, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fascinating. That sounds good. I can't wait to hear the results. So stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned for sure. Um, what are some of the important research issues you feel chiropractors need to address in the upcoming years? Yeah. Well, just recently, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, the Canadians, uh, have come out with, um, their top chiropractic research priorities. And uh, I, I echo those ones, but then I have a one or two to add. So they suggested integration of chiropractic care into multidisciplinary settings, uh, also to look at costs and cost effectiveness of chiropractic care. And then they suggest looking at the effect of chiropractic care on reducing medical services. So those are the three that just came out uh, from uh, Canadian researchers, their their top three. So I like those as well, and I'd echo those. But uh, I'm going to bring in my bias here from a psychology and a kinesiology background. I And what's permeated, I think, most, if not all of my studies is how does chiropractic affect behavior? I think we need to spend some time on that. And when I say behavior, I don't necessarily mean... Um, you know, the emotional sides of things. I, I am talking about what we can visibly see, what we can measure in terms of movement. Um, so we know, for instance, that lifestyle has a massive impact on health and to have this impact requires doing. So what is it about chiropractic care that can get people engaged in these lifestyle behaviors? Is it that adjustments help people to reduce their pain and move and then as a consequence, move better from less pain? Or does it have an independent effect on their behavior, regardless of their pain levels? So that's what I find is interesting. And so does it affect their coordination patterns? Does it affect, as we're looking at in this extremity study, the orderliness uh, or the disorderliness, I guess, on the reverse side of things? Does it affect those kind of 
uh, behavioral patterns. That to me is, uh, is really interesting because when I think about the big picture of our health, it's all about behavior. It's about what you're doing to promote your health and wellness and how does chiropractic play a role? That's, that's what I think we can and should be looking at. And I'm totally biased, uh, because that's what I do. <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, that that's really interesting. And finally, uh, a goal of your podcast series is to motivate and assist practitioners and students alike in, in pursuing research careers in chiropractic science, should they, they be interested in doing that sort of thing. Uh, can you offer any advice to aspiring chiropractors who wish to become scientists or researchers? Yes, definitely. I, I see a few different paths available to students and practitioners. Uh, one path might be to start getting involved in publishing uh, case studies like we just talked about, uh, uh, letters to the editor, uh, possibly even reviews of the literature. And so that would be a great first step to start getting your feet wet and getting the research bug, so to speak. Uh, another path would be to actually engage a little bit more, well, a lot more, and to start pursuing some graduate education. Uh, this would be either uh, to pursue a master's degree and or a PhD in a subject matter of interest. And I'd recommend uh, consulting with um, different advisors at uh, the various universities that you might be interested in going to, uh, read the, hopefully read the researcher's results and then um, contact them and find out if they're accepting uh, PhD students. So I think that's a good way to do it. Um, in, you know, from my experience, it, it was possible to work part-time in practice going through grad school. Uh, again, only because my wife was uh, also engaged in practice. If she wasn't, I, I'm not sure I would have been able to do it uh, if the structure wasn't there. So those that are considering pursuing a PhD and doing that full time, that, that is certainly going to be uh, something that you want to think about. Uh, unless you're a student, of course, and, and you haven't started in practice, then I think it would be an easier transition. Um, but I'd suggest contacting those researchers uh, uh, slash advisors in advance, discussing what their program might have to offer you. And then another thing I'd also recommend is try to look for any possible funding that you can get. Uh, I know, for example, when I went through school, uh, I got uh, tuition paid for um, and a slight amount of money uh, towards living expenses. Uh, and fortunately, I was also able to receive, a, <clears throat> at the time, uh, FCER had grants for students. And so I applied and, and received, uh, twice, um, an FCER grant to pursue the PhD. So that's not happening right now. At least FCR is not, but to my understanding, NCMIC, uh, might be funding students. And I don't know about elsewhere across the world, but I would certainly check into that because, you know, it takes money to go through school, as you might imagine. And uh, if you're not practicing, you, you probably need some sort of uh, extra income. And it's always nice to have chiropractic organizations or associations uh, support you along the way. Uh, beyond that, I'd say just immerse yourself in the experience. Uh, learn as much as you can during school. Go to scientific conferences. Write a lot. And most of all, enjoy the experience. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and you'll have so many wonderful things to share with the profession as a whole as a result of those experiences. I mean, we all get PhDs in different subjects, it seems. And all of that uh, variety is something that can contribute and, and benefit the profession as a whole. So I say, you know, study whatever you have interest in and, and bring those research methodologies, bring those concepts and, and hopefully uh, be able to apply those to the profession for its benefit. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Well, this has been a real pleasure to, uh, uh, to talk with you on, on the work that you do, Dean, and, and your important contributions to research and education and your very unique position as both a 
an active clinician and an active uh, teacher, researcher at a major university. Um, that's very unique, and we're very fortunate to have you uh, as a part of chiropractic. So um, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, wrap up the podcast, and, and I just thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Well, Greg, I, I really appreciate you uh, spending the time uh, today to interview me. Uh, and uh, I've, I've always uh, been interested in your work. And to be interviewed by you, my chiropractic mentor, is just outstanding. So I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and thank you so much for all of uh, what you do. I've, I've learned from the best. I've learned from you. Thank you.